The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the monthly Committee on Gas call. Um, this is Kira Zeidelman with NARUC, um, and at this point, I will turn things over to Chair uh, Diane Berman, um, who will introduce today's uh, topic and speakers for us. Commissioner Berman. Thank you. Hello, my name is Diane Berman. I'm a commissioner with the New York State Public Service Commission, and I'm also the chair of the NARUC Committee on Gas. Last month, NARUC announced the launch of a new natural gas partnership with the U.S. Department of Energy. We cannot be more excited. This partnership enables NARUC to continue its value-added focus for members of NARUC as well as stakeholders on looking at emergency technologies and best practices in natural gas regulation. As furthered under the DOE NARUC Natural Gas Infrastructure Modernization Partnership, which ran between 2016 and June 2020. I am happy to be chairing once again, not only that partnership, but the continuation of this new partnership. One of the objectives of the Natural Gas Partnership is to facilitate knowledge sharing and interaction between states and the federal government. To that end, we've invited leaders of the National Petroleum Council to share their thoughts on the outputs of the Council's 2019 report, Dynamic Delivery, America's Evolving Oil and Gas Transportation Infrastructure. I am a member of the Nat National Petroleum Council and was also on the Committee on Oil and Natural Gas Transportation Infrastructure. Andreas Thanos, who's the staff subcommittee chair for NARUC's Gas Committee, was also on the Supply and Demand Task Force. The National Petroleum Council is a federally chartered, privately funded advisory group whose sole purpose is to provide advice to the federal government in order to advise, inform, and recommend policy options. With memberships both inside and outside of the oil and natural gas industry, the Council is well positioned to provide diverse perspectives to policymakers and regulators. The dynamic delivery report involved more than 300 stakeholder representatives. The report examines the present state of US transportation infrastructure today and assesses infrastructure needs under varying demand assumptions. The study reviews constraints to growing domestic oil and natural gas production caused by infrastructure limitations that reduce domestic demand on energy exports. In addition, the report evaluates technology and policy options for improving infrastructure siting and related permitting processes, which in turn could improve safety, environmental performance, and resilience of the system. As state energy regulators, we share these priorities and seek to contribute to and learn from these educational discussions about how to achieve these goals at least cost to energy customers in our states. I'd also like to say before we get into who the members um, on today's webinar, I'd also like to give my condolences on the loss of, of Barry Worthington, the Executive Director of the United States Energy Association. Many of his members were involved in this process. It is a tragic loss personally and professionally to so many of us. On today's webinar, we will hear from key members of the National Petroleum Council, including Sean Bennett, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oil and Natural Gas, U.S. Department of Energy, Amy Shank, Director of Pipeline Integrity for the Williams Company, Paul McNutt, Reserves and Development Manager for ConocoPhillips, Brooke Harris, Global Gas Demand Development Manager for Upstream Oil and Gas LNG ExxonMobil. Mark Jabetta, Vice President for Environmental Permitting and Regulatory Affairs for Williams Company. J.D. Churchill, Senior Vice President, Health, Safety and Environment and Projects for Philip 66. Doug V. Sauer, Manager of Midstream Asset Integrity and Regulatory Compliance, Philip 66 and Vice President of Philip 66 Pipeline LLC. In addition to thanking today's speakers, I want to also thank Christopher Freitas from the U.S. Department of Energy 
for his support of the Natural Gas Partnership, and Jim Sloots, Director of Study Operations for the NPC, for his assistance co coordinating this discussion. And of course, Kira Zeidelman, Senior Manager for Nehruk Center for Partnerships and Innovation, who has really been a key staff liaison helping to coordinate all of this. Please see the handout tabs for full biographies of today's speakers, as well as a copy of the presentation. These will be distributed via email to all registered attendees following today's webinar. Feel free to submit questions via the Q&A tab. We have reserved time for questions towards the end of the webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and available at www.narook.org. At this point, I'm going to turn the webinar back over to the MBC speakers and Kira. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Berman, and uh, thank you again for being the, the chair of the DOE NARUC National Gas Partnership. The, you know, the Department of Energy happily supports the great efforts of NARUC to facilitate the exchange of information between state regulators, federal agencies, and other natural gas stakeholders on emerging technologies and investments in natural gas and other energy systems. And this really this new five-year commitment uh, between DOE and NARUC, uh, uh, NARUC partnership uh, will continue that critical engagement. Also, special thanks to Kira Zettelman for his scheduling this NPC Dynamic Delivery webinar here today. Um, you know, for those who aren't familiar, uh, the National Petroleum Council uh, was established in 1946 at the request of uh, President Harry S. Truman, and really is a it is a federally chartered, uh, privately funded uh, federal advisory committee that advises the Secretary of Energy on matters uh, related to oil and gas. And so the NPC provides advice and forms of studies with findings and recommendations uh, really relevant to the public policy of, of, of today's, you know, questions and concerns. And, you know, if you look at the council itself, it's really a well-balanced organization with about two-thirds of its membership uh, representing the oil and gas industry, whether it is upstream, midstream, downstream, and all sections of the country from large and small uh, companies. And the rest of the balance is from academia, uh, financial research, Native American, and public interest organizations and institutions, and, and really comprises of approximately 200 uh, individuals, and it's selected uh, and appointed by the Secretary of Energy. Now, since its establishment, the National Petroleum Council has prepared over 200 reports, and really just in 2019, um, the NPC delivered three reports in response to requests of, from the Secretary of Energy. Uh, the first one was an update, really a supplemental to our earlier Arctic potential uh, study, which is a follow-up to our 2015 uh, pot Arctic potential study. And then meeting the dual challenge, which was focused on carbon capture use and storage, which really, you know, was kind of answering the questions of how do we move forward uh, using CCUS and, and making sure that it's viable here in the future. And the one that we are presenting today, which is dynamic delivery, which is focuses on the U.S. oil and natural gas infrastructure. Now, as Commissioner Berman mentioned, I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for the Office of Oil and Natural Gas here at the Department of Energy, but also served as the government co-chair for the NPC Dynamic Delivery Study. And I would like to thank the NPC as well as Amy Shank, uh, who is with us here today, who is my industry co-chair, uh, as well as Mark Jebbia, uh, both from Williams, uh, Paul McNutt from ConocoPhillips, Brooke Harris from ExxonMobil, and Jay uh, Churchill and Doug Sauer from Phillips 66 for their leadership on the study effort. And really, I, I couldn't say enough about really the broader theme, uh, the study team. It was a lot of organizations, a lot of individuals committing uh, a, a very uh, exhaustive amount of time to deliver this product that we're all very proud of. And this all culminated from a request from the secretary uh, back in 2017, September of 2017. This was when Secretary Rick Perry uh, was the Secretary of Energy, and he was really looking for the council's perspective on the present and future state of U.S. oil and natural gas infrastructure. You know, being the former governor of Texas, it was something that was near and dear to his heart and something that he often worried about when he thought about hurricanes coming up through the Houston Ship Channel was how will everyone get their energy in the event of a crisis or in the event of a situation where there are not enough pipelines or not enough infrastructure put into place to ensure uh, reliable and consistent energy. And he wanted us to really look at the growth in the oil and natural gas industry 
really being that game changer for economic growth and providing that energy security and you know how do we advance that energy security and in doing so recognizing that the united states must continue producing all of its energy resources from fossil fuels to sources like nuclear hydro wind and solar and you know with this um you know with recognizing this truth you know how does that require or what will require that new investment in energy infrastructure because without infrastructure the potential to realize these full economic benefits of our resources and, and true energy security is really unrealized now i will say uh, when we finished the study in december of this year uh none of us on this uh, webinar uh, none of us in the study really uh saw the COVID 19 pandemic uh being anticipated or, or even uh, being afoot and that has you know uh definitely introduced a significant degree of uncertainty and the industry and, and the world are facing those unprecedented challenges now the timing and the path of recovery for the pandemic is uncertain however you know the oil and gas industry can play a significant role in propelling the recovery forward and looking forward we will be needing the oil and gas sector to thrive beyond this time for uh of disruption and uncertainty and the findings and recommendations of the study provide insights for policymakers and business leaders really to consider and act upon uh, the support of return to prosperity and you know a lot of the uh, issues raised also fall right into the doe's purview when you think about advancing technology research in development and quantifying and reducing methane emissions, improving integrity of oil and natural gas infrastructure through enhanced inspection, and R&D aimed at protecting our energy infrastructure from oper for, through operational technologies from cyber threats, as well as developing an agile uh, regulatory pathway for the testing, evaluation, and acceptance of a lot of these new technologies. Uh, and I just really also want to say the study team highlighted that the, you know that the nation faces the dual challenge of providing affordable energy to support economic growth and human prosperity while addressing the environmental uh, effects including the, the the risk of climate change and many of the stakeholders across the industry government and the market are taking actions to mitigate mitigate these risks uh, for example the, the move by natural gas suppliers state regulators consumers toward a lower carbon intensity of the delivered fuel and pipeline infrastructure network has led to R&D focused on the decarbonization of natural gas. Hydrogen, is, uh, I would say, is, is really emerging as a low carbon fuel uh, option for transportation, like generation manufacturing, uh, and utilizing existing infrastructure, such as pipelines, storage facilities, can help facilitate quicker adoption of, of hydrogen. And, and that is something that the United States Department of Energy is actively investing in, and in R&D, as well as analyzing the relevant policies and potential markets uh, to sustain uh, for sustainable hydrogen economy. So. You know, this is really a, a broad study, a great study that, that we're very proud of. And with that, I will kick it over to Amy. So, Amy, thanks. Thank you so much, Sean. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, can you advance the slides, please? Okay. I think we already covered that. Go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, just an overview. First, I want to thank uh, Kira and Commissioner Berman for this invitation. Um, an awful lot of work by an awful lot of people went into the study, and it's really great to have the opportunity to give you a um, introduction, and that's really all it will be, as the study itself was, um, at the end, over 600 pages long and represents the hard work of over 300 people. Um, I also want to thank the, um, the the principals and staff at the NPC for helping us through this process. Um, the way that, that these studies get conducted is, as Sean described, um, there's a, a, a letter or request from the Secretary of Energy uh, posing specific questions um, to the National Petroleum Council, and then a someone who is a member of the National Petroleum Council gets nominated and approved to be the the chairman of the of the study. And so, for this particular study, um, our CEO at Williams Allen Armstrong was nominated to be the chair, along with um, the government co-chair, uh, who was the deputy secretary at the time, Dan Bruyette, under Secretary Perry, and uh, then. The study continues, the study committee continues to be built um, by first establishing a steering committee, 
um, of leaders also uh, that are members of the National Petroleum Council. And then the what's called the Coordinating Subcommittee is named out of the Steering Committee. And what you would see if you looked at kind of an org chart is that every Steering Committee member uh, appointed one or more uh, people from their organizations to uh, help lead the Coordinating Subcommittee. And, and then we looked at the, the subject, um, all of the questions that were being asked, all of the expertise that was needed, and we started filling in the rest of the coordinating subcommittee um, with, with people who are, are best in class and knowledgeable in specific areas of expertise. Um, after that, we developed a roadmap for what our study um, would ultimately look like, and you'll see, you can see the four uh, subcommittee groups um, in green, and those ended up representing chapters. So we have four chapters, supply and demand, infrastructure resiliency, mapping and analysis, permitting, siting, and social license to operate, and technology advancements and deployment. Um, I also want to mention that at every level, of the organization of the study was um, a, a government co-chair from the Department of Energy who sat with us tirelessly, made sure that we had the resources that we needed and that um, we were staying, staying really on, on, on task or within scope. So um, it's not that we um, always had to maintain the scope as it was assigned by the, the request letter, but um, we did uh, make sure that we answered the questions that the secretary asked first before we delved further, maybe down some other um, topics uh, that were related and really needed to be added in to fill out uh, the study. If you go to the next slide, please. So the beauty of the National Petroleum Council study uh, regardless of what the topic is, is the makeup. And just like the National Petroleum Council itself is made up of um, oil and gas industry representatives, it's also made up of many other um, representatives that Sean mentioned, like academia, NGOs and think tanks, consumer groups, um, financial consultants, other governmental agencies outside of the Department of Energy. So we had representatives from um, some state regulatory bodies. We had um, DOT, particularly FEMSA. We had um, Department of Interior, the Corps of the Army Corps of Engineers represented uh, FERC, just to name a few. And it, you see, can see from this uh, pie chart that actually the oil and gas industry representatives uh, made up a minority of the participants. Um, I also failed to mention the Native American uh, tribes that really provided a lot of a fantastic insight into um, particularly how you engage stakeholders when you're trying to build infrastructure. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, leave the introduction and hand it off to Paul McNutt, who chaired our supply and demand task group, which is where everything began. Thank you, Amy. And I'll assume everybody can hear me. My lips are moving so we can see and hear, but uh, just to cover this very quickly, uh, I guess our chapter gets the honor for going out of uh, scope more quickly than anyone else in this one. Obviously, things changed very rapidly between December and now. And some of those factors that made things change are listed here. Obviously, not a pandemic, uh, things like that, but access to capital, the resource base, cost and resource prices, market access. Lots of shifts in the market happened over the last six months, particularly on the supply side. And since oil is an internationally traded product and now natural gas is an internationally traded product, uh, that ripple all through the markets. Government policy plays a big part and obviously this study, uh, you'll hear about that uh, in the later chapters. And technology, and the biggest piece of technology that we cover in this study when we look back is the horizontal drilling and fracking boom that really brought Appalachian gas to the forefront. 
and really change the way the infrastructure runs in the US and where it's routed. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here were some forecasts that we pulled together and I'm proud of the fact that uh, our study group and our subgroup uh, pulled together not only forecasts from the normal sources, but some of the independent uh, commercial organizations uh, and then across the world. And you can see forecasts here for oil and for natural gas. And I would encourage you to look at the study and it goes down into the basin level. And that basin level really is important to say supply changes, sources of supply change, where the demand is changes, and you have to continually hook that up with new infrastructure over time. But you can see the key finding there, and it's a pretty exciting one, that the U.S. has become the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world. Again, ripple effects there. Uh, but another one that may not be obvious to everybody was that the increased natural gas displacing coal to generate electricity was the single largest contributor to reducing U.S. CO2 emissions by 15% since 2005. And that's pretty exciting. It's, it's moving us along a path of uh, less energy intensive production and less CO2 intensive production. Let's go to the next one. So I mentioned the basin by basin look and here are the geographic shifts. Again, oil on the left and natural gas on the right. And let's just zero in on that natural gas look there. You can see Appalachia was basically at, a, a, at the zero level in 2005. And by 2018, it, it was uh, basically contributing 20 to 25% of the US supply of natural gas. And that led to, you know, saw prior to that time period, plans made for LNG import terminals and natural gas was becoming an internationally traded commodity and we were going to import natural gas to make up our needs. But Appalachia alone, along with those other areas, helped to turn that around into LNG export. And again, we go back to policy, we go back to price, we go back to the things that shape production and supply and demand. And this was a huge, huge change and put the U.S. in an interesting position. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So here are the shifting of flows, again, oil left, natural gas on the right, and uh, the big shift in Appalachia. And the industry uh, with government agencies, with permitting agencies, did everything that we could to use and reuse and repurpose existing infrastructure to move natural gas and crude oil around in the U.S. and then began to lay new pipe where new pipe was needed. This has happened over time, over the decades as new basins were developed and exploited within the US and around the world. And our existing infrastructure of pipelines is a result of these decades of investment, large scale investment to move oil and gas around the country. So these geographic shifts in production have led to significant changes in both traditional crude oil and natural gas flows. Next slide, please. Thanks. Natural gas liquids is a big part of this too. And you can see historically, the US produced about 2 million barrels a day of natural gas liquids. These are the liquids that condense out of the well, out of natural gas wells and out of oil wells, out of natural gas. And then we use that a lot of times for feedstock and plastics. And that doubled to 4 million barrels a day in, by 2018. And forecast had it growing even further. Now, as you look at these forecasts, you take it with a grain of salt that not all of them are strict forecasts trying to predict exactly what's going to happen. Some of them are scenarios where they've been uh, basically dreamt up to say, if we want to uh, have a certain outcome, what does it take to get there? That might be a two degree scenario, maybe some other scenario, uh, but it's a mixed bag of, of forecast, reference cases, base cases, all sorts of different words in there. But we wanted to give you an idea of the envelope of the kind of range things could happen there. And obviously, if you look at by 2050, the Permian and the Marcellus, the Appalachian plays account for more than 50% of US natural gas liquids production, as well as the natural gas itself. Go to the next slide, please. Here are refined products demand. So that's the supply side. On the demand side, we see liquids generally staying flat or falling off a little bit. If we go to the next slide, let's take a look at the natural gas. Oh, sorry, this is the carbon constraint. So back up just a minute and I'll talk to uh, natural gas. This is refined products and liquid consumption. On the natural gas side, the demand continues to grow in most forecasts over the next 20 years. Uh, 
Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. You'll see some of that here in these carbon constraint scenarios. And let me work from left to right. That's 2018 broken down by oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, and building up from the bottom. And then you have the EIA reference case. And you can see natural gas demand growing in the reference case there, that second orange bar uh, in the stack. In the IEA, now we switch from EIA to IEA, uh, new policy scenario, that's NPS. You can see natural gas basically holds its own. Only in the sustainable development scenario by 2040 does natural gas shrink, but you can still see it's the number one energy provider in the world in that case. Uh, so that is a very, very important uh, kind of finding from this study. If you look at all these scenarios, natural gas continues to play a pivotal role in the US and around the world. Okay, next slide, please. We talked about import versus export, and you can see a lot of this activity is located along the Gulf Coast, and many of you are probably aware of all the activity around LNG, but the U.S. economy can benefit further from increased export of oil and natural gas. Uh, it's not a U.S.-centric or U.S.-only story. It is a global, international story, and we keep our eyes on that on a daily basis. Next slide, please. So with that, this is the value of infrastructure. I'll turn it over to Brooke and take it away, Brooke. Great, right. thanks, Paul. Well, in addition to depicting uh, the evolution of oil and gas transportation infrastructure, the infrastructure resiliency mapping and analysis chapter also details the value associated with and enabled by our infrastructure. The economic value specific to midstream infrastructure generally falls into five categories, which are detailed in the study at great length. Uh, economic growth, job creation, increased exports, as Paul just alluded to, domestic manufacturing competitiveness due to lower cost of energy and raw materials domestically, and finally, households and businesses benefiting from market efficiencies enabled by our resilient and adaptable infrastructure. Again, you'll find a great number of great details in the study, including analysis on a few key regions who have seen tremendous uh, changes in their economy and benefits therefrom, thanks to the infrastructure development, such as in Appalachia and out around the Bakken region. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of infrastructure constraints, I guess, and we're in slide 15, sorry, I'm flying blind here on my cell phone. Infrastructure constraints, we started delving into uh, where do we see emerging bottlenecks? But first, starting on a positive note, the study found that existing infrastructure has been modified and adapted to near maximum capacity to accommodate and enable the uh, surge in uh, changing supply and a growing supply that Paul des described. And that's required uh, significant investment to date and we'll need to see continued investment to sustain this growth. When new infrastructure is delayed, bottlenecks form or worsen. These bottlenecks result in regional pricing discrepancies, fuel shortages, and the missed opportunity for US citizens to benefit from the lowest price energy alternatives. The study highlights, among others, three critical bottlenecks, which are listed on the slide here. The first is natural gas pipeline access in New England and New York. As Paul just described, we see a tremendous amount of growth coming out of Appalachia and in the gas sector, and we need to see more pipeline uh, capacity to bring that production to market. The Port of Houston is another critical potential bottleneck. The Port of Houston is proximate to the NGL infrastructure in Mount Bellevue, Texas, which makes it the largest exporter of NGLs in the US. And the Port of Houston is also a significant container port and receives other bulk cargoes. And congestion is therefore a significant issue. The US Army Corps of Engineers is currently studying options to deepen and widen the channel. The third key bottleneck identified in the study is export capability as Paul just alluded to. 
Domestic infrastructure will be required to serve both foreign waterborne crude oil imports as well as the growing exports that we just talked about. And these challenges will be amplified given the concurrent expansion of export infrastructure for NGLs, LNG, and other commodities. The expected increase in exports will require dedicated export infrastructure and common infrastructure such as marine waterways and ports. Finally, as you all know, the ability to produce crude oil is frequently dependent on the ability to take away <clears throat> the natural gas and NGLs that are produced with crude oil. For example, Permian Basin takeaway capacity for oil, natural gas, or NGLs has occasionally been constrained, leading to situations in which producers have needed to defer drilling until new capacity is built. The lack of natural gas takeaway capacity has led to the increased flaring of natural gas back in 2019. While waivers have allowed for temporary flaring, this may not be possible long-term, making growth in infrastructure critical. Next slide, please. Labor shortages and a lack of specialized skill sets was another key finding of the study. And therefore, addressing labor shortages and a lack of specialized skill sets will be necessary to support future infrastructure development. As the energy mar sector market has expanded an acute skilled labor shortage emerged, a 2018 industry-wide survey determined that 80% of construction firms were having a hard time filling hourly craft positions. In addition, there is also there is a lack of skilled labor training of workers at the community level. And in the absence of adequate supply of skilled workers in the community, projects must use transitory labor to meet their needs. Skilled trade training and apprenticeship programs will help build a skilled workforce at the community level and also maximize the economic earning potential for those communities. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes a few of the key recommendations out of the infrastructure resiliency chapter. And what, what the study in, in the NPC are recommending to maximize infrastructure value first, to mitigate the negative impacts on interstate commerce brought on by friction between federal and state interests, the NPC recommends that all levels of government should engage in constructive dialogue about the overall economic benefits from the nation's energy resources. At the same time, industry must engage with stakeholders and work to minimize impacts and risks. Second, in order to maximize the economic contribution of ports and inland waterways, the MPC recommends that Congress fully appropriate, appropriate the revenue coming into the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund and the Inland Waterway Trust Fund to restore and maintain all of our ports and waterways to their authorized dimensions and exp expand where needed. Finally, to ensure a skilled workforce is ready and able to build and maintain the infrastructure that we need, the NPC recommends that the federal government, along with states, secondary schools, and industry work together to promote vocational career education and advocate for registered and accredited apprenticeship programs. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the infrastructure chapter also describes the resiliency of our nation's infrastructure. And the study concludes that our energy transportation resiliency is the ability of an infrastructure network to continue meeting demand even when portions of the network have been disrupted. The graphic on this slide illustrates the various supply chains that were studied and that it makes that takes many types of infrastructure working together to prov provide the resilient systems we enjoy. And that includes trucks, rail, marine, and pipelines. The shale revolution illustrates the resiliency of US oil and natural gas infrastructure. Up to now, our flexible interdependent infrastructure systems have combined with technology to facilitate the development of the tight geologic formations that previously had been inaccessible, bringing the tremendous benefits to consumers I highlighted earlier. The resiliency of the U.S. oil and natural gas infrastructure relies on the, follow, on a, the following characteristics 
first multiple modes, as I mentioned just now, the integration of the different modes of transportation at different places across the country is the key characteristic that enables, that enables a high level of reliability and flexibility. Storage is also critical. It provides resiliency both at the side of production, at market, and that also at market and demand centers. Multiple routes is also are also critical. They enable hydrocarbons to reach their intended destinations in the event that um, a blockage occurs in, in one route, uh, we can divert to, an, to another route. And a good example of that would be um, moving crude oil directly from West Texas to the Texas Gulf and the other moving crude oil from West Texas to the large oil terminal in Cushing, Oklahoma, and joined to a pipeline moving crude oil from Cushing to the Texas Gulf. In the, inter in the event of an interruption to the first pipeline, crude oil supply could reach its destination via the second pipelines. Now, as resilient and extensive as the U.S. oil and gas infrastructure system has been over, proven to be over the last 10 to 15 years, as I mentioned earlier, our existing infrastructure has really been expanded and modified to the maximum capacity, and additional infrastructure will be needed to meet future demands. However, significant challenges exist in the permitting and siting processes, as well as with community engagement that could delay, limit, and even prevent this much needed expansion. I'll turn it over to Mark now as he'll detail the recommendations the study makes to improve these processes and mitigate these challenges. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the simple part now onto the permitting. So if we can go on and advance the next slide. And so in, in this eye chart uh, really kind of shows some of the complexity that, that uh, we're dealing with when it comes to permitting, you know, really the linear type of infrastructure. So looking at you know, the charge we had as a, a study chapter was to look at all state, local and federal permitting for oil and gas transportation by pipelines, marine, rail and trucking. So quite a quite an undertaking we started trying to map out some of these permitting processes and you know really kind of hitting one of our uh, key findings here is that as you start working on linear projects so whether it be a pipeline or a rail or for that matter a you know, electric transmission line you know um, or or anything else that's linear and you're crossing over jurisdictional boundaries between federal and state agencies and local zoning authorities uh, the complexity of the permitting process just gets um, increasingly more difficult. Um, and so this, this chart here really just tries to show the federal process. Uh, so this is the, if you were trying to construct an interstate natural gas pipeline, uh, this flow chart captures what you go through from uh, federal review and authorizations. Uh, so a lot of times these, you know, these processes become uh, duplicative and don't necessarily run concurrently. So you might wind up reviewing environmental impacts to the same environmental receptor uh, over and over again through multiple uh, permitting processes. Um, so instead of going painstakingly through each, each box on this flow chart, we'll just go to the next slide and talk about some more of the findings. Um, so the recommendation uh, that came out of this study was really, you know, we need to identify ways to improve coordination between federal, state, and local governments. Um, you know, ideally, uh, as you're reviewing routing of a project and, and permitting requirements, um, focusing less on that administrative process of the permit itself and, and really taking that first step to scope the project correctly and identify um, from everyone's point of view, what are the key issues that need to either be avoided um, or mitigated through the routing of the project. And then through the permitting processes at state and federal and local levels, really identifying what are the mitigation measures that need to be in place to have reduced or eliminated the environmental impact. And so there's a lot of measures that are in place or in the works um, uh, that have happened since this study. You know, I think first and foremost would be the uh, um, there on the right side of updating the NEPA regulations um, that was uh, addressed by CEQ uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and really just kind of looking for 
uh, kind of the core focus of these recommendations is looking for ways to improve uh, permitting process efficiency. Uh, everybody is on limited budgets, um, so helping uh, state agencies collaborate with federal agencies to improve um, the efficiency of everyone's review to make sure that projects are being built in an environmentally friendly manner and taking into consideration um, the input from, from agencies. Um, you know, one of the other recommendations was for uh, there on the left side under state and local was looking towards you know, industry to work with state agency organizations such as uh, um, you know, ECOS and, and others that could help construct a model for permitting linear infrastructure uh, in state processes. So having a consistent uh, way to go through a state agencies and, and a single point of contact. Uh, and that, again, that helps out for really any, you know, not just um, oil and natural gas projects, but could help on any type of linear linear work. And there was one other um, prong to our review in this chapter, and it's covered on the next slide, because um, once we kind of got through really unpacking and looking at all of the permitting processes, the, the secretary had also charged us with really evaluating um, how those permitting processes address stakeholder concerns. Um, and so we had a, a large effort around stakeholder engagement and looking for you know, the best practices that are out there around uh, project sponsors on, on engaging stakeholders at being you know, landowners, local communities, um, to really understand at a, at a microcosm level, what are the key issues and to make sure that that, that input is heard and, and addressed. Um, so first and foremost, um, early engagement, um, having a presence in communities was heard loud and clear um, through all the, the workshops that we did to gain some of the uh, input from, from stakeholders. And really having that engagement there is kind of serves a lot of um, purposes. It really provides a great point of two-way communication so that if a stakeholder does have a concern, it, it can be heard and addressed and that loop closed as opposed to, you know, really the stakeholder becoming frustrated and trying to find the right way to elevate that concern. Um, it provides great opportunity for education, uh, both from the project sponsors trying to construct a project and from the uh, local stakeholders to the project sponsor. Uh, and we reviewed a lot of the um, engagement best practice documents that are out there, and we made a recommendation to industry to really follow uh, the good work that's been put out by a lot of the trade groups, um, INGA and API and others on um, engaging a community uh, as a part of these big big infrastructure projects. We can go on to the next slide. And so the, those evaluations and recommendations really address a lot of the uh, what we would call the traditional uh, stakeholder concerns around you know, safety of the project and things of that nature and you know were, were the impacts kind of traffic wise and local community related. And one other charge we had from the um, secretary was you know, evaluating uh, how those permitting processes address climate concerns. And through all the workshops we, we conducted and feedback we received, you know, climate change is clearly um, raised as a major finding from the public and stakeholders uh, and regulators. And um, it, it incorporates itself into almost every permitting process, whether that permitting process is designed to address, address it or not. So we had lots of discussions around this and really talked um, in depth at how, how can infrastructure be constructed that considering you know, climate change concerns and, and to address those. And you know, the first two chapters of this study, I thought really did a great job of, of setting the stage that even in a carbon constrained environment going forward, um, there is a need for oil and natural gas and, and a need to continue to be able to construct and maintain uh, the infrastructure to get the lowest cost supply to the demand centers. And so um, kind of looking at these key findings, you know, we definitely face a, a dual challenge of providing affordable energy to support the needed economic growth and human prosperity, uh, while at the same time addressing the environmental effects, including climate change. Uh, 
industry has been doing a lot of great things. Uh, I know that the natural gas side, especially around the, the focus on methane and, and industry really uh, looking at how to reduce methane emissions, uh, seen a lot of success on that. We, the study made a recommendation that industry continue to do uh, a lot of the voluntary efforts around managing methane emissions. And that you know, at the end of the day, the permitting and construction of these infrastructure projects, it's gonna continue to be challenged, delayed or stopped as a result of litigation. Um, there's unintended consequences from that, which we saw in a lot of the projects that have been delayed of either increased emissions because of a delay in natural gas getting to the end use or increased costs. Uh, and so made a recommendation um, that for Congress to really look at um, revising NEPA from a congressional action to clarify how climate concerns should be addressed. And at the same time, putting in place a national uh, policy on carbon so that there is a framework to address uh, CO2 emissions. And I think that's all we had on this slide. And I think I kind of talked talk through uh, these recommendations here of continuing the voluntary measures of managing methane and then congressional action to have that dual, dual approach of revising NEPA and putting in place a national policy. And with that, we'll turn it over to Jay and Doug and talk about the, how technology helps address the stakeholder concerns. Hey, thank you, Mark. Hopefully everybody can hear me. In the development of the technology advancements and deployment chapter, we had well over 100 people engaged, really for the purpose of looking at how we can utilize technology to advance the safety, reliability, efficiency, and environmental performance of the nation's oil and gas infrastructure. We studied all the modes of transportation, including storage, as well as a special request to uh, look at uh, cybersecurity for our infrastructure facilities. If you look at the uh, chart on the left, it's really a proxy for uh, environmental and safety performance in the transportation of uh, liquid fuels. You can see that every mode of transportation has the capability to deliver fuel and product to its final destination safely and at performance levels that are greater than 99.999% of the time. However, you also see in this chart that there are accidents that still happen where, where there's spills. As an industry, we are committed to continuous improvement and the elimination of those accidents. When you look at the chart on the right of this diagram, you see that our industry has been a leader in workplace safety. And the different uh, segments of our industry are better than industry or private industry average when it comes to injury and illness rates. And many parts of our industry are operating at illness rates that are a third of what private industry and totality delivers. Uh, during this study, we looked at a lot of different uh, technology advancements to promote uh, safety and environmental performance. But one of the surprises that also came out for me was the importance of safety management systems in driving performance improvement. And that's because you get the commitment of the industry to plan, do, review, and improve in all aspects of your business, particularly safety and environmental performance. We also saw a common thread among many of the modes of transportation where a collaborative relationship with regulators and moving to a more performance-based regulatory framework would aid in the promotion of uh, technology adoption. I'm now going to turn it over to Doug Sauer, who co-led the technology advancements chapter 
and allow him to cover key recommendations for pipeline storage LNG and quickening the pace of technology adoption. All right, thank you, Jay. Yeah, so in addition, in addition to safety management systems that are so vital to driving all of this, uh, our MPC team had some recommendations for the pipeline sector. And uh, firstly, we identified that industry operators and DOE should pursue additional research and development opportunities to focus on improving the inline pipeline inspection technologies particularly for identifying cracks that are more difficult or more challenging than some of the corrosion and other kinds of threats. And then also to advance remote sensing technologies that can improve detection of uh, emissions as well as geohazard or geological hazards uh, that exist. Um, and also in addition to around geohazard threats, one of the uh, challenges is just the simple cost of data acquisition and our team would recommend it that we should uh, DOE or government industries agencies and industry should help facilitate more data sharing of this of this data and then and that'll drive additional analysis to again look for uh, other threats that may not be visible with the naked eye and then lastly around pipeline technologies I want to focus on methane emissions. Methane emissions have gained a lot of attention, as we know, in recent past, uh, particularly uh, as, as with the climate concerns. And um, a, a statistic I wish to share around transportation of, uh, of natural gas is that while consumption volumes have increased more than 40% since 1990, in that same time frame, transmission pipelines and storage sectors have actually reduced their methane emissions by over 40 percent and NPC uh, has recommended some additional research and development to pursue some innovative technologies to lower those emissions even further and this can include identifying and quantifying gas fugitive emissions at compressor stations and it can also look at compressor engine efficiencies that can reduce methane emissions next slide so now let's talk about the storage facilities. So underground storage of natural gas, is, as we all know, is a critical component of the natural gas supply chain. Uh, and as pointed out in the Aliso Canyon gas well leak that, was, that occurred back in 2015, uh, addressing gas well design and in inspection technologies is really critical to reducing the risk of safety incidents uh, of underground natural gas facilities. And our NPC team recommends that uh, DOE lead a collaborative effort along with PHMSA and industry operators to pursue additional research and development priorities on improving the, the well integrity, the well design and inspection technologies associated with these gas wells. This can also uh, help improve or reduce the frequency of tubing removals, which is both a safety and uh, emissions improvement. Okay, next slide. So LNG. Uh, Let's talk about LNG storage. This industry has really advanced its safety uh, significantly since its inception. And, and as we know, there's been tremendous growth globally in liquefaction facilities. Uh, our recommendations on the LNG side is really about updating regulations to reflect or recognize the, the latest design codes and standards that are being used today. Um, and to recognize the relevant risk-based standards that are used internationally for LNG export projects. These, uh, these can improve the cost competitiveness uh, for US LNG operators as well. And then lastly on LNG, um, industry should work with PHMSA to develop tank inspection standards that are specifically uh, designed or uh, applicable to the characteristics of LNG storage. Okay, and next slide. Okay, um, let's, so let's move through the marine and truck and rail slides and continue to go to a slide titled Regulatory Barriers. Next slide. Okay, continue. And one more. Okay, thank you. Okay, so technology development. It's, 
it's occurring across all of the modes of transportation that our team studied. It's been very successful in helping to drive uh, safety and environmental improvements. Uh, our team looked at ways to accelerate technology development, to actually accelerate these, these uh, safety improvements. And in addition to regulatory barriers, when it comes to technology development, companies face a variety of challenges, right? It's, uh, it's the time and cost involved in developing technologies. It's the ensuring that there's adequate acceptance testing. And then, of course, there are some regulatory impediments, and I'll talk about those. So prescriptive regulations, for example, uh, they certainly have a place uh, in the regulatory regime. But one thing about prescriptive regulations that when it comes to new technologies is that they specify this, a particular method and technique uh, to apply. And this can hinder the use of alternative technologies that actually have a potential to achieve improved performance or improved outcomes. So our team recommends that DOE, or excuse me, DOT, FEMSA, lead a collaborative effort to create a clear and agile pathway of performance-based criteria for the regulatory acceptance of new technologies rather than prescriptive regulations. We also recommend that DOT establish a process for field pilot testing uh, and these programs to encourage additional field testing of new technologies. This can again accelerate the acceptance and deployment of technologies and, and thus treating trial runs as trial runs. That's really important. And then of course, once established, industry should pursue pilot projects that fit within this framework that really offer the potential to accelerate um, technologies or uh, adoption with a goal always ultimately of improving public safety and improving the environment. Uh, the last thing is around technology development investment. We feel like additional investment could be could be made in this space if we had a, a framework that would be more favorable in terms of supporting cost sharing and investment recovery. So hence we're recommending that DO T and DOE promote, excuse me, FERC and regulatory agencies along with DOT, DOE to promote laws, regulations, and even public-private partnerships that can support cost sharing and investment recovery. And uh, we think that that can fuel more money into the, the idea of, of technology investment. Uh, that's it primarily on the technology advancement front, and then I want to hand it to Jay to wrap us up on cybersecurity. Yeah, next slide. From a cybersecurity standpoint, our work specifically focused on the protection of operating technology that is used within industrial control systems. And no surprise to, to anyone, you know, cyber threats are increasing. It's a priority for the uh, U.S. government and for industry to protect our assets from cybersecurity. And these threats are growing because they're being challenged both due to increasing connectivity and growing bad actor, threat actors in the world that are working to create havoc. If you look at that diagram on the right, you'll see how industrial control systems will link up to corporate networks and the internet for the sharing of information. Originally, many of these control systems were really um, isolated from the broader network or so-called air-gapped that really reduced the avenues for a cyber exploit. Access to data, analysis of operating technology information has really benefited businesses for improving um, um, efficiency and safety and, and all of that. And with that, we've increased our connectivity, as well as we've seen a convergence from equipment suppliers for the types of equipment that is used both within uh, the IT world and the OT uh, world, which creates additional uh, risk. Next. So our recommendations, uh, primary recommendations, really revolved around adopting a strong performance-based security, uh, cybersecurity management standard, 
uh, in the pipeline industry. This is API 1164. That standard was last updated in 2009. Uh, the new one's uh, being uh, upgraded and will go out for public comment a little later this year. And it will promote a multi-layered uh, defense that is consistent with the NEST uh, cybersecurity uh, frameworks. The second recommendation had to do with making sure we had access to uh, vetted and trusted entities to carry out cybersecurity assessments within critical infrastructure. And uh, these assessments need to be informed by current threat intelligence and lessons learned from other um, activities. Our third recommendation was to have a culture of learning around cybersecurity, much like we do with uh, incident reporting and sharing within our industry. Uh, we need to improve the transparency of cybersecurity incidents, both within our organizations and external with industry and government. And through these investigations and sharing, we can identify needed improvements to improve our cybersecurity management systems and practices. And finally, we really do need a collaborative effort to prioritize research that's aimed at sector-wide uh, pr protections of critical infrastructure and we do this by the many established working groups uh, between the Department of Energy and other players to prioritize these projects. And that concludes our technology update. Thank you. So uh, we can now take questions. Uh, just a reminder to please submit questions in the question box or raise your hand and I will call on you to unmute you. Uh, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I did want to mention an upcoming webinar from our colleagues at the National Regulatory Research Institute. Uh, it's called Aiming High, New Jersey's New Framework for Demand Side Management Programs. Uh, that is this Wednesday, August 19th, from 2 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. And the featured speakers are from the Brattle, the Brattle Group and New Jersey Natural Gas. Uh, so that is uh, open for registration at NR, nrri.org. Um, and with that, let me try to call on uh, Lisa from Oregon. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Did you have a question? Right, maybe not. Uh, we will go to Andreas next. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I had to make a comment first and then uh, a, a question. Uh, it's interesting because the uh, second to last uh, session uh, the one right before uh, the cybersecurity, the technology session. Uh, it's it's interesting because at NARUC, uh, through the support of the Department of Energy, we are working on identifying and, and uh, listing technologies that are available right now for the detection of leaks, methane, and the uh, integrity of the infrastructure. Granted, uh, at this point, we, uh, we, we are focusing primarily on the local distribution network as opposed to the interstate uh, transportation network. But those technologies can easily be expanded to address larger pipes and larger throughputs. Uh, so the question that I had uh, is, considering the current circumstances, uh, what are the recommendations of the report that we can take and apply uh, in our situation today where we see uh, an increased demand in residential energy and we are going to see for the foreseeable future uh, and uh, also with uh, the reduction in LNG exports due to the reduction in demand because of COVID-19. And with that, again, thank you, and I'm waiting for a response. Thanks.
Thank you, and Andreas. Some... Did... Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, is, is Doug still on to address the methane detection question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so, so our team, when it came to technology advancements, we focused on technologies that could improve safety and environmental performance. And we first analyzed the, what the causes of accidents were. We identified that the leading causes are uh, things like corrosion related failures, excavation incidents, uh, incorrect operations and, and equipment failures, for example, those were a few of the leading causes. And so then we honed in on some recommendations to address those specific types of causes. And, and we did that for each of the modes of transportation. But I guess around uh, some of those are very, I guess, uh, applicable to uh, natural gas, oil pipelines. Uh, I mean, even uh, even rail, for example, we had some very common things with, with, with rail track uh, infrastructure inspections and things like that. But I guess um, when it comes to methane emissions, we identify the types of what's causing methane emissions, right? And so, um, so we found that most of those are occurring at compressor stations and they're caused from fugitive emissions. They're also caused from uh, maintenance practices, uh, venting and blowdowns, for example. And we uh, have some recommendations around trying to identify ways to reduce uh, the number of blowdowns that need to take place or the number of venting. And so that can involve maintenance standards, uh, and technologies associated with that. So uh, I don't know if that may answer your question, but kind of looked at it from that standpoint, what's causing the incidents and then put recommendations together specifically to address those leading causes. Uh, thank you. It's interesting because uh, in Massachusetts, we were doing the same thing uh, about a a year ago or the less than a year ago we we're trying to figure out how to calculate the emissions of uh, low downs and, and 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 everything else with whatever you want to uh, activities that the local distribution companies were taking and uh it's it, it, it like, like i said earlier it's it seems that it's basically the same thing we are facing at the local distribution level but it's just on a on a grander scale if, if uh if, if you want to put it this way, but it's uh, it, it obviously it's something it's a race that we are all participating in and hopefully we will be able to address those concerns sooner rather than later and uh, we can all look at it after. <laughs> Thanks for the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll, uh, Doug, I'll add to your answer. Uh, this is Mark Chevia. So you know, we discussed some of the voluntary efforts going on and you know one of those efforts that was covered in the study, uh, One Future, uh, you know, it goes beyond the scope of the study. It's really, it's focused on the entire natural gas supply chain from wellhead uh, to burner tip and sharing those um, best practices in both quantification and detection of leaks um, and emissions to also uh, getting rid of them and, and driving towards uh, better and better improvement on, on uh, loss rate of gas through the supply chain. So that's, I would say, the uh, that's the area where it really comes together from from the multiple parts of the industry. Thanks. So on the on the other question, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Kira. Uh, uh, yeah, on the, yeah, on the other question, uh, the the one, are there any major takeaways that we can take and and apply? Uh, in our current situation, in our current uh, slash COVID-19 uh, related situation that we can, uh, I guess, uh, going by with my parallel, downscale that uh, per perhaps uh, uh, state regulatory agencies can, uh, can take into consideration in their efforts uh, looking towards the future? I think that's really getting to the the supply and demand drivers. And Paul, do you have anything to add or opine on around uh, supply and demand in the post COVID and also post study world? <laughs> yeah. So post COVID, you were starting to see some rebound in Asia, in particular, and in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, 
uh, but in different degrees. And everybody's, uh, I'll say, I think if you find the person that can predict it well, uh, they can make a lot of money, but uh, we'll see where we go from here. And specifically speaking to demand based on the COVID impacts. And then beyond that, we are find ourselves in a world of abundance in terms of supply. And I think the question that people are asking long term is 10, 20, 30 years from now, the role of oil and gas uh, alongside of renewables in the energy mix. So we've got things that are happening on a long time scale at a very high macro level. We've got things that are at a macro level on a very short time scale, and that's the COVID pandemic. And then we've got, uh, you know, geologic time, if you will, in terms of the amount of supply that we've got there. Uh, so all these things interplay and the market's been pretty efficient at balancing supply and demand over time. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Yes, I have to agree on the, on, on the, on the, on the increase, the, the rebound, although my time uh, estimate is more than a few decades, considering that there are nations, in, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, where demand is about either to start, like in Vietnam, or uh, increase significantly as they move off uh, coal and oil. So I don't see the, 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 the future of natural gas as bleak as some would want it to be, but, <laughs> but uh, you're absolutely correct. The, 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 it will balance. The question is uh, always uh, at what point, what's the balancing point where, where it's lying. And thank you for the responses. I will leave the floor to others. Thank you. And because we, this is Mark Jevia again, and because we all had such a unique take on this where your questions kind of bring us all together, um, I think that the, uh, you, you also kind of asked about anything that the regulators can, can take up from this. Um, and I think, you know, that, that is the point where it's the, those making permitting decisions are thrown in the middle of, uh, what, what amount of natural gas, you know, or oil is, is okay and allowable in um, in a low carbon future. And that's where I think the work that, um, Paul did in the supply and demand section really helps give that basis that there's, it's still a needed piece of the energy mix. So if you can approve a, a project and still be, um, on track for a, a lower carbon future. And that's the crux of our recommendation on the congressional action piece. Makes sense. <laughs> yes. <Yep. laughs> Mark, this is Kira. We actually received a question um, asking for a little more detail about the council's view of a national carbon policy. So if you could maybe expand on uh, some of the assumptions that we made in modeling that or um, kind of what, what the council views as uh, as an optimal um, carbon policy for oil and gas infrastructure. I'm not sure if that's really within the scope of the report, um, but we just had a question asking for a little more um, explanation on that point. Um, and and you, you pretty much answered it right there that uh, the, the name of the game in trying to tackle a study this large was managing scope. And we did not get into studying the uh, economic impacts of various carbon schemes. Um, we just opined simply that that is something that needs to be debated and debated at a national level. Um, what we're observing is that a environmental policy debate is really playing out on individual projects and that's not the most efficient place to have that kind of a debate and it's something that should be done at a congressional level. Um, so that was, uh, we did put in a lot of the words of, you know, economy wide and uh, um, technology agnostic and, and all the, the things that, that sound really good, um, but did not go into the, the study on exactly what that would look like. Thank you. And uh, not seeing any other questions come in, I will uh, take the chance to ask one myself. So um, I uh, just wanted to um, hear about what's next for the National Petroleum Council, um, either any studies that are, that are currently underway or um, any initiatives that are planned to uh, take off uh, sometime later this year or, or next year, kind of what's on the horizon for uh, you all. Uh, well, uh, this is Sean Bennett here. Um, uh, as uh, I kind of set up, Brian, it, it does require a request from the secretary 
Um, right now, there are not currently any uh, studies that are underway. Um, you know, I, I think as we continue to see what is evolving, uh, especially with COVID, um, you know, will there be an opportunity uh, for a study uh, or at least an exercise uh, to recognize and, and, and see, you know, what are the lessons learned? Um, you know, we have not uh, approach that idea yet, but that is, uh, you know, definitely something that, to consider. Um, and then uh, moving into next year, um, you know, what will be the secretary's um, and viewpoint and, 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 and questions that he will ask. And, and, and that is up to, you know, whoever that secretary is. And, and again, as I said, these studies were brought forth by Secretary Perry uh, currently. Uh, now we have Secretary Boyette. And, you know, these are, you know, really trying to find those topics that are important to those individual secretaries. And the MPC will pursue whatever those uh, whatever those requests are. Thank you. And uh, we just had one additional question come in on how the Department of Energy is implementing the recommendations from the Technology Advances Development uh, chapter of the report. Um, and we we recently or in February at the Nehru Quinter Policy Meeting, we heard about. Uh, RPE's repair program, the rapid encapsulation of pipelines avoiding intensive replacement, uh, which recently announced uh, $33 million in funding for different projects that were looking at ways to uh, repair or, or rebuild a newer pipe inside of uh, aging pipe. Um, so we wanted to um, get your uh, thoughts on how the DOE and uh, RPE are helping to implement some of those recommendations on advancing uh, new technologies. Yes, and, and that repair project is, is is really a very unique project. I mean, when you think about all the uh, bare steel cast iron pipe that, that, that is in the ground, and, and how do you replace that with, you know, minimally evasive ways? Uh, because again, uh, digging up and, and taking lines offline uh, are, are definitely are, are definitely disruptive. And we want to ensure the safe delivery uh, of that. And I, and I do believe that the RPE program is definitely a new and novel way to kind of approach that, and it's very important. Uh, for, for some of the studies, uh, whether it is the cyber portion and the collaboration with uh, DHS and, and uh, uh, DOT, uh, you know, kind of increase that collaboration uh, as we continue to move forward, update those regs, and ensure that we, we stay on top of the cyber uh, security portion of, of the study uh, and collaborate with our with our fellow agencies is very important to us. And also a lot of the recommendations that have come out of uh, the MPC study and technology and development is, is really helping us craft our roadmap uh, of what we're going to start applying here in the future uh, in, in future budgets for our midstream R&D program. Um, you know, the great thing about this study, especially in, in the R&D uh, technology and deployment uh, portion, was really trying to get a an idea and a sense of you know what ideas do we need to focus on uh and whether it is again i mean one of the main cases is ensuring that we have uh pipe uh that 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 is that is efficient functional and in the ground and we're able to deploy new technologies uh that are able to fix that pipe in an expeditious manner and that means you know again working with uh dot femsa and so forth and making sure that we're collaborating with them to ensure that new technologies are put into the field sooner rather than later. Because uh, we want really, you know, these technologies to be the speed of business and make sure that we have a, a safe and efficient pipeline infrastructure, as well as uh, looking at compressor stations, uh, looking at methane emissions, whether it's uh, uh, quantifying and mitigating the emissions, which is very important. Uh, really, it's given us the, the roadmap to see what are those areas that we need to focus our attentions on our emissions program to ensure that you know we are emitting less, the pipes are stronger, more reliable, and ensuring that the safe delivery of natural gas as well as liquids. Thank you. I think with that, we've gotten through all of the questions that we've received. Uh, Commissioner Berman, did you have any uh, questions or final thoughts as we wrap up? All right. Um, hearing none, I will uh, just thank all of our panelists again, uh, as well as Christopher Freitas and uh, Jim Slutes for uh, both of your help in coordinating this webinar. Uh, I think the uh, neighborhood membership was very grateful to uh, hear about the uh, conclusions in this report. 
Um, so we thank you all for uh, spending the time with us and um, are uh, looking forward to future activities under the Natural Gas Partnership. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good <laughs> afternoon. And this is Diane Berman. I was um, on mute. I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks all for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.